So the presentation that I will give in this evening um, are called Harm Reduction, the Importance of Peers and the Prohibitionist Policy. Um, it's sort of an updated version um, of a paper two years ago about Cybercash. It's a consulting compassion and drug control. Um, but this has sort of been a bit expanded to not just talk about Cybercash, um, but to also talk about such safety as well. Um, I just want to mention that um, there were three different organisations that I'm coming from, um, but that this is me talking in a private capacity um, and not expressing views of any organisation per se. Cool. So, in terms of what I'm going to talk about, I'm going to start with giving a bit of background on harm reduction, um, particularly as to where harm reduction in the UK currently is, um, because there's a sort of political and legal background really. Um, influences the work that we've done by harm reduction organisations. I'm going to talk about two case studies in a bit of depth. One is Sash Safety, uh, an online peer led harm reduction organisation, uh, and the other side, Ed UK. And I'm then going to go on to basically talk about why I view peer led harm reduction as being so effective, but, the, the diff but also talk about the difficulties that it faces in Britain today. And then I'll conclude. Um, I've also included a few slides about um, the loop. Um, I'm not sure if I have time for them, but if not, we can talk about that later. <coughs> so, firstly, um, I'm talking about peer led harm reduction. Um, I think, in its truest form, a peer in this context is someone who has a lived experience of using drugs. Um, so, I'm talking about harm reduction that involves people who use drugs. This is quite different to professional-led harm reduction, the sort that you might get from a doctor or from, um, yeah, from someone in a professional capacity. But I'm not wanting to say that um, peer-led harm reduction is only for people who use drugs. I think there's quite a lot of grey area around it. Um, there might be people who are sort of very knowledgeable about drugs, but don't necessarily take them themselves. Um, but really, the difference between peer and professional-led harm reduction is that I think with peer-led harm reduction it's between two equals. Um, it's not got the power dynamic that's involved um, in professional dynamics. So harm reduction, sort of briefly, harm reduction is a policy that aims to reduce neg negative effects associated with drug use. Um, it draws from a public health model but also <coughs> Um, has a sort of strong um, basis in human rights and respecting the rights of people who use drugs. Um, it's often contrasted with um, a law enforcement model, so that's the model of drugs are illegal, it's a criminal matter, people should be punished by the legal system. But it also contrasts with um, a medical view of drug use that sees all drug use as problematic and warranting medical treatment. So, in terms of how I would define harm reduction, and what I think separates harm reduction from other models, is that harm reduction seeks to reduce the harms associated with drug use without necessarily trying to reduce the amount of drugs consumed. So for harm reductionists, they would be very happy with an outcome where people continue to take the same amount of drugs, but less people got ill and less people died. So in terms of the background of harm reduction, because it does kind of, um, it's important to understand in terms of what organisations today are trying to contend with. Um, harm reduction in the UK in recent years, last 30 years, something like that, um, has been quite a medicalised model. Um, so, and, and by medicalised I mean that there was a big push in the 80s towards harm reduction, but it came from a starting point of fear about um, the spread of HIV. So harm reduction, as it emerged in the 80s, was very much a harm reduction that involved um, needle exchanges, um, prescribing methadone by doctors, but it came from a very strong public health um, perspective. And it came from a public health perspective that was to um, reduce HIV within the wider population, and not just in relation to helping drug users. In recent years, um, I think that 
we've moved much further in terms of the problem on policy level from harm reduction towards um, promoting abstention in drugs. So the drug strategy in 2017, which was the government's five-year plan on how to tackle drug use and how to um, deal with drug use, didn't mention harm reduction. Um, although that's not strictly true, um, it did mention harm reduction once, which is in the context of harm reduction for people who smoke cigarettes. There was no mention of harm reduction for drug users. Um, there was also, although peers were involved, and peers were sorry, mentioned in the drug strategy, it was all about recovery. So the drive from government at the moment is that drug use is a medical problem and that people need to recover from it. I'd also mention that in the nighttime economy, so this is things like nightclubs and festivals, that the licensing requirements and the current sort of legal structures make harm reduction really hard. So from a festival's point of view, or a nightclub's point of view, they don't have an onus from the state or from licensing bodies to um, provide harm reduction. They have an onus to stop drug use. So providing harm reduction is seen by some licensing bodies as actually an omission that people are taking drugs on site. And certainly I know that festivals have been threatened to lose their license because of provision of harm reduction. Um, because it's seen as, it's better from, you know, it's better from the perspective of many festivals, or so they would say, <coughs> put your head in the sand, um, because the actual structures are so, um, the, the structures are so difficult. So largely speaking, I think that drug use is seen as a medical problem, particularly on sort of wider society or on the state, or as a matter of criminality. But I would argue that this misrepresents most drug use. Um, most drug use isn't problematic drug use. It's not drug use that requires a medical intervention. It's drug use that is periodic, it's um, regulated, <coughs> and it's managed. Um, and the problem with a medicalised model of drug use is that for most people they don't view their drug use as a medical problem. They don't view using ecstasy once a fortnight, or using drugs every now and then is something that they need to attend a drug service for, or to attend a doctor for. And indeed, there's not much that a doctor or drug service could offer. However, even if that drug use shouldn't necessarily be seen as a medical issue, or one that requires sort of professional healthcare intervention, it still carries risks. All drug use carries risks, and I guess what I'm pitching out here is harm reduction that targets that drug use. It's not a drug use that's likely to be seen by services, you know, the GP drug services, but it's still drug use that carries risks. And those risks can be reduced and they can be managed. <coughs> so I guess my key point here is that there is harm reduction that exists from the state or from the NHS. Um, and in that harm reduction, so for example, needle exchanges or methadone, um, that is effective for a certain subgroup of drug users, but it's not effective for most people who use drugs. <coughs> and because of this, we need to look elsewhere for how to provide harm reduction for the general wide population of people who use drugs. And I guess the rest of this presentation, to some extent, is me claiming that I think peer-led harm reduction is a highly effective way of targeting this group of people who use drugs but don't necessarily, um, aren't going to necessarily respond to a medicalised approach to drug use. <coughs> so, first is slash safety. It's um, a sort of online e-community which is, um, I guess, a posh way of describing a Facebook group. Um, it's had various degrees of members over the years um, that I'll go on to explain why in a bit, but at the moment it's got 22,000 members. It's what I call emphatically peer-led, so the vast majority of people who staff it, run it, are people who use drugs, um, people who have used drugs, 
Um, and it's certainly not, it's, it doesn't take a professional approach. It takes very sort of a, everyone seems equal to the limit. Um, in terms of how we approach the drug use, um, it doesn't distinguish between types of drug use. So it answers questions in relation to injecting opiate use, or more commonly, um, sort of inverted commas, recreational drug use, so MDMA, ketamine, cocaine. And it helps, yeah. Um, it's got a strong harm reduction focus, so it promotes harm reduction in all sort of posts that are put forward. And as well, it's got quite a strong sort of evidence-based approach to harm reduction. So if someone offers advice or someone contributes on a topic, they are certainly to be able to justify what they're saying, usually with scientific papers. And there's never been very recent research on who uses such safety and what membership is. But largely speaking, it's young people. It's generally UK based, but there are people from overseas. Most people use that aren't dependent on any drug. They use drugs periodically. And most people aren't in touch with healthcare professional style drug use. They're people who use every now and then and potentially want a bit of advice on something. So in terms of what it provides, it provides sort of questions and answers, so people can post questions, they can also submit them anonymously. It might be a question about um, you know, what's the interaction between drug A and drug B, and then people respond to it, and um, you know, responses are filtered. Um, it also sort of offers private messaging, so if someone's got something that they don't necessarily want to publish or have posted online, they can um, they can have a chat with someone who will be able to listen or potentially give them some advice about what they're saying. As I said, we also uh, have been involved in giving away a lot of reagent test kits. So these are test, drug testing kits that you can buy online and that you can use at home to test what you're taking. It doesn't tell you the purity of what you're taking, but it does tell you what active drugs um, are in the sample you have. Um, it's also a platform to share news. Um, when I say the drug market alerts and trends, when there's a dangerous substance in circulation, um, that will be posted and people will sort of flag, flag up early information about drugs in circulation. Um, it's what's called generic content creation, which is, again, a sort of posh way of describing making a meme um, to try and engage people in harm reduction. Um, Obviously, you know, what gets shared online isn't usually a long, detailed post about a specific interaction. It's you know, a picture of a frog that's just taken too much MDMA. <laughs> um, and also, we offer signposting and support. So, there's a lot of things that might come up that can't necessarily be dealt with by an online peer communication. Um, an online peer led organisation, sorry, that so, you know, involves posting with people towards the right service, which sometimes is proper drug services. Um, and more to the point, I think it's a community of people who use drugs or who have experience of using drugs. Um, and it's a community where people are safe to ask questions about drug use without being moralised or without being scrutinised. <coughs> so here's a sort of example, the sort of thing that might come up. Um, does anyone in the audience have any suggestions for what you might say to John, who says he's taking MDMA tonight for the first time? Do you have any tips? Anyone? Perhaps not alone? Yeah, mm -hmm. definitely. Okay. <laughs> Just check it? Yeah. Tested it. Tested it, yeah. Don't be shy, take part in the lab with that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Right. 
um, the mental state that someone's in. So, you know, one of the effects of MDMA that is that it's not just a physical effect, it's a psychological effect. Um, <coughs> how they're planning to consume MDMA. Most people swallow it, and that's what general kind of harm reduction advice would say is a better way to consume MDMA, but some people might snort it. Um, what things you should do beforehand might be offered as advice. I, you know, what are you, are you well rested? Do you have any food? Um, water. Don't drink too much. Don't drink too little. So about a pint or so an hour. But roughly speaking, drinking the quantity of MDMA you normally would get to achieve your goal. Um, you also get your drugs tested. You do this at home with your reagent tests. All the ways you can get drugs tested for labs standards. So you can send it in the webinars for one, um, which is a postal service where you can get you can send a bit of drugs in and they'll tell you exactly what's in the drugs that you're planning to take. Um, supplements, these are things magnesium suggested to take by some people while taking MDMA. It reduces the effects of gurning and sort of muscle tension and five HTP. I'm not sure there's that strong evidence based for it, but it's suggested by some people to take afterwards for the compounds. And just knowing like what, you know, a bad reaction is, like what to look out for. Um, a lot of people don't know what, what the warning signs when you take the drugs that maybe you need medical attention. So there's loads you can say. Does anyone see an issue with giving this information to someone who's wanting to take MDMA? Seeing like uh, you're trying to encourage their use? Yeah, so that is the that is exactly the argument that gets pushed against this. Um, so in terms of Facebook, that's Facebook's terms on drug use. So Facebook ban you from posting content that I mean it's a bottom tier that's just relevant, but it bans content that provides instructions for the use of non-medical drugs. So any instructions around drug use, even if they're to reduce your drug use, they're against Facebook's terms. And the same can be said for a lot of other social media um, companies. And likewise, increasingly Google, you can knock them down, harm reduction advice down the Google um, algorithms. Usually being replaced by the drug addiction centers based in the United States. So in terms of what it means, it means that there's no distinction between encouraging drug use, so encouraging people to take drugs, and encouraging people who are already planning to take drugs to use their drugs more responsibly. So if you encourage someone to reduce their use, moderate it, or be more considered, that's a breach of Facebook's terms. Um, and actually really, it's pretty much all harm reduction, because providing instructions for the use of non-medical drugs is kind of what a lot of harm reduction is. It's, you know, giving people advice on how to consume it, what method, what preparation to take, etc. And the final thing I'd note is that one of the things that Facebook doesn't like is admitting in writing to the personal use of non-medical drugs unless posted in a recovery context. So you can't share a story about drug use unless <coughs> you're saying that you're in recovery from drug use. And I think that this is one of the issues um, that I'm going to talk a bit about later. But the, there's a narrative around drug use that's often accepted sort of in wider society, which is the idea that someone stops taking lots of drugs, their life falls apart, they lose their job, their marriage breaks down, they hit rock bottom, and then they stop using drugs and they go into recovery and they live a, sort of a happy life. But that's not actually the story of a lot of people who use drugs. A lot of people use drugs, use drugs a little bit, and then they stop for a while, and then they use them a bit more, and then they stop for a bit, and then they use them a bit more. So the whole story of recovery, it doesn't relate to most people who use drugs. And in terms of the consequences of this, the consequences are that harm reduction information is getting shut down. So, This is an article from 2018, but since then, 
um, various other pages have been shut down. Uh, so how it works is the page gets banned by Facebook because it's promoting drug use, a new one gets created, people join it, and then that one gets banned. Um, and it's, I just want to mention as well, it's not, it's not just around sort of recreational drug use. Um, the groups that are encouraging naloxone distribution, that's a drug that reverses the effect of opiate overdose, they're being shut down. Um, and the information around shape, sorry, safe injecting practice is being shut down. Because again, if you are giving advice on how to sterilize needles or how to inject in a safer way, that amounts to condone, supposedly condoning drug use. So I'm not going to talk a bit about Psycare. Um, Psycare is a welfare and harm reduction charity that's been going for 12, 13 years. Um, so in terms of 2020, we're you know, looking to do 10 or more events, usually ranging from 1,000 to sort of upper end 1,000 <coughs> attendees, probably usually around the two, three, four, five thousand mark. Um, I think compared to other welfare organisations, Psycare has a, a real specialism in managing sort of acute drug and use psychological crises, um, particularly around psychedelics, but also around um, other substance use. I think some welfare organisations perhaps can manage, some welfare provision can manage um, the distribution of condoms and water and that side of it, but perhaps struggle with the more intense reactions that Psycare often end up dealing with. Um, as well as that, Psycare, you know, we really promote harm reduction. Um, take a very non judgmental approach to um, drug use that sort of neither condemns nor condones drug use, um, but that encourages people to think about what they're doing and you know, give advice to reduce risk. So these are a few pictures I took years ago, so particular harm reduction stuff is a bit out of date, but um, we usually operate with two spaces, so the <coughs> top left picture is a tent that we often refer to as the arm tent, and this is a space where people who are often quite intoxicated um, or being quite rowdy um, are put, and they'll be offered support, um, you know, often just water, food, um, but a place to sort of sit down. Um, the bottom picture shows some of the harm reduction information we give out, so the other side of that tent in the top left, we have a table that we have sort of a TRIXIT interaction chart showing the risk of certain drug interactions and harm reduction leaflets and information, and as well as that there will always be someone there who can answer questions around drug use. We also have a space, um, the top right one, which is a separate tent, and that this is predominantly for people who are really struggling, perhaps need one-on-one -on -one support, um, someone who maybe is going through a really, really challenging experience and is finding the whole festival and their drug experience quite overwhelming. Um, so people can go in there and they'll often sort of sit one-on-one -on -one or two-on-one -on -one with volunteers who will talk through um, what they're going through. <coughs> so I'm kind of going to mock thing that Psycare might often have. Um, so someone arrives at Psycare who believes there's a conspiracy to harm them um, and that people on site are threatening to kill them. Um, there's no explanation of sort of who they are or why they might be doing it, whether they've been following them around. Um, there's sort of often women that are quite paranoid, but as, as you speak to them, they might talk about something different and then flip back to high levels of paranoia. And they come to side care because they want assistance to protect them, to, to protect them from the people who are trying to harm them. And also sometimes the suggestion that people want to get off site to get away from <coughs> Does anyone have ideas on how you might manage this? All the sort of things that you should at least be considering. Because um, obviously there's a lot of unknowns to this. So more just like considerations in handling this. 
if they have an existing mental illness or if it was drug induced? Yeah, so that's something that I think is good to know. It can be hard to find out, um, but definitely it's good to know sort of the background of the why someone's presenting in that way. Grounding them with maybe physical sensations and literal distractions, whatever that could be, or conversation. Yeah, definitely. So um, I did a bit of this again. Um, most, well, quite a bit of it was being covered. So I think I don't know hit the nail on the head in the sense of I was thinking that you know, when someone approaches you in a sort of state like this, um, it's very important that you know you've got trust with this person, right? And they're not trusting other people. So maintaining that trust um, and not dismissing or contradicting the person. Um, <clears throat> obviously with psychedelics, you know, you'd be thinking about the setting. So where is an appropriate space or where is going to help this person go through their experience? Um, I think in a situation like this, one might say, you know, well, you know, I don't know what's been going on, but you know, if these people are trying to help you, then you know, I've got a safe space, you can sit down, have some tea, and you know, sort of go there. Um, and then you're kind of not contradicting the person, you're moving them to an environment where it's easier to contain like one of the side hair tents. I think listening is really important. Um, it seems quite obvious, but you know, when people are going through difficult experiences, um, they usually have something important to say um, for them, <coughs> nothing else, and listening can, is really critical. Um, reassuring, just always sort of reassuring the person that you're in a safe space now. Um, I agree about distraction, I think it sometimes it's helpful, I think in cases when someone's um, particularly when someone's exhibiting like signs of paranoia and then moving into a more normal conversation, when they're in the normal conversation, really trying to hold on to that normal conversation. Um, I think at times when people are really, really set on something and really set on talking about something, trying to distract them can result in them feeling bored and you or that distraction doesn't always help, but I think it often does. You want to make sure that the person has basic needs are met. So they might not be able to communicate that totally adequately. So do they want food, water, are they warm, um, things like that. I think it's good to know what drugs are being consumed. Um, something that Psycho kind of would never say to someone, like, what drugs have you taken? Because it, that sort of feeling of interrogation can result in people shutting off. Um, but you can kind of gently, in conversation, ask her, you know, 
having found them in the Great Dirt Sickness Festival, something like that, where it doesn't sound like you're interrogating them. <coughs> I agree about friends. Um, I suppose things, <coughs> last year I'm not saying you do this at all, and there's things you might consider. So you might consider informing other agencies on site if someone's you know, threatening to leave site, that's a pretty big safety risk. Um, and also, you know, it sounds like it's a psychedelic experience, but could there be something else going on that you possibly would want medics to be involved with? Again, not saying that necessarily would. So, so this is um, kind of the bit where, um, yeah, this is my case as to why I think PLO harm reduction is effective, um, and why I think that peers should be more involved in harm reduction. So kind of returning back to what I said before, I'm not defining peers solely as someone who uses drugs, um, although I think you know, often that is what it means. I'm defining peer as a kind of relation of equals, um, some level of shared life experience um, and shared experience that sort of creates the relationship. So the first point is one I've kind of already stressed quite a bit, that peer-led harm reduction is effective because, well, 